on January the 12th, 2007, on a cold Friday morning around 7.50, a man wearing jeans, a t-shirt, and a baseball hat walked into the D.C. Metro subway lobby during rush hour. He took a violin box, he opened the case, And he began playing music for somewhere in the neighborhood of 43 minutes. Nearly 1,100 people walked by in that lobby while the man played, while only seven stopped to listen. 20 people or so tossed money into the violin case, which in total, after the 43 minutes was over, totaled $32. The subway violin player was the child prodigy and Grammy Award winning, world-renowned classical musician Joshua Bell. And the six songs that he played during that 43 minutes were six of the most difficult and detailed classical songs ever written. You see, just a few days before this event, Joshua Bell had played in an event in Boston where the average seat cost well above $100, which in 2007, given today's inflation, I would say is somewhere around $300 or $400, just based on being alive in both times. The Washington Post actually paid for this experiment. And what they concluded was that most people don't recognize greatness when it's in their midst. You see, our problem with greatness is that we all desire greatness, but we desire greatness for the wrong reason, for recognition and for notoriety. Pride, generally speaking, is the driving force behind our desire for greatness. It's really a love for self, not a love for others that drives us to greatness. And by, world, and by the worldly standards, That is exactly what we should do, is strive for greatness in order to get a position, in order to get a platform, in order to get notoriety, in order to be famous. If you talk to any of my children at any given time, all five of them at some point in time would tell you and you say, what do you want to do? I want to be a famous YouTuber. It's the world we live in. But in the kingdom of God, greatness is not defined by position. It is not given to those who are of great notoriety. It is not the one who gets the most recognition who is considered great in the kingdom of God. There is a different agenda altogether. Tony Morita said this, he said, the gospel frees us from our addiction to ourselves. He goes on to say that mortification is the soul's vigorous opposition to self, wherein sincerity is most evident. In today's sermon, we are going to continue our march through the Gospel of Mark, looking at the end of chapter 9. And the title of the sermon this morning, for those of you who are taking notes, is The Cross-Shaped Life. As we see Jesus not throw out the concept of greatness, but rather completely redefine what greatness truly looks like. The main lesson we're going to learn from our text this morning is that true greatness is found in serving others and in mortifying sin. And so my hope and my prayer for everyone in this room today is that God would bring about a cosmic shift within our hearts in the way we view greatness and that we would aspire to greatness through the way that we serve the people who are around us. And so let's take a moment. Let's set up the context of this remarkable book. John Mark penned this letter, or penned this book. He, he wrote it from Peter's perspective. He wrote it primarily to show us what it looked like to know Jesus, who Jesus really was, and what it looked like to be an obedient follower of Jesus. And so first and foremost, he wanted his audience to know who the biblical Jesus was. And he wanted his followers to understand what it looked like to live a life that followed and pursued after Christ. He wrote it 
to the Romans, to, un, or to, to those that were converted under severe persecution. And he wrote it to encourage them and to show them what it looked like to follow Christ in the midst of that persecution. In the previous couple of stories, by the time we lead up to this, we know that Jesus has cast out demons. We know that Jesus has raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. Jesus has done many miracles. Jesus was transfigured in the beginning of chapter 9. He went up on the mountaintop with Peter, James, and John, and he literally displayed his glory, the greatness that was inside of him to those three men while he had a conversation with Elijah and Moses. They come down the mountain and they find the disciples having an argument with the scribes and the Pharisees because they couldn't cast out a demon out of a small boy. And so Jesus then cast that demon out. And that's where we're going to pick up in our text today, beginning in verse 30 of chapter 9. And if you are physically able, I want to invite you to stand with me one more time in honor of and in reverence to the reading of God's inerrant life-giving word. It says, they went on from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know. For he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. And they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent. For on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down and called the twelve. He said to them, if anyone would be first, he must uh, be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and put him in their midst. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not, uh, not me, but him who sent me. And John said, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. And Father, I ask that you would add your blessing to the preaching of your word. God, I pray that you would fill me with the spirit. I pray that your hand would be on me. And God, I pray that you would bind me to the truths found inside of this passage. God, I pray that I would speak truth. God, that you would use those truths. God, as the Holy Spirit works in our hearts to impress them upon us, God, to mold and shape us into the image of Jesus. God, I pray for the family members that came today. God, simply to see a loved one dedicated to, in the life of the church. God, I pray that you would work in their hearts. God, I pray that the lost would hear the gospel and they would respond through repentance and faith. God, I pray that you would do great and mighty things during this time through the preaching of the word. We love and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. I want to give you four facts about a cross-shaped life. A cross-shaped life. The first fact we're going to see this morning about a cross-shaped life is that a cross-shaped life, number one, is lived in obedience to God. Let's go back to the text and let's look again at verse 30 and 31 at what it says. It says, they went on from there and passed through Galilee and he did not want anyone to know for he was teaching his disciples saying to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed, uh, after three days, he will rise But then verse 32, but they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Here we find Jesus making his way through the region of Galilee and he is doing so quietly in order that he could spend some time alone with the disciples and he could invest in them and he could teach them as they went along the way. This was a time of teaching and a time of discipleship. It was not a time of public ministry where Jesus was going to be casting out demons and Jesus was going to be teaching the the great crowds that were there. And I want to note the importance of spending time alone with Jesus because it is an essential element of serving others. And as Jesus gets to the very heart of what it means to be great this morning, we must first see that the disciples needed to spend time alone with 
Jesus. And if we are not willing to get alone in our houses and in our rooms and in our prayer closets with God and open up the word and spend time laboring in prayer, it is going to be very, very difficult for us to serve a lost and hurting world around us. And in fact, I will tell you it's impossible. The reason why so many Christians and so many pastors burn out in ministry, oftentimes it is because a lack of discipline in spending time alone with Jesus. And so walking intimately with Jesus and being taught by him is a non-negotiable for everyone within the church. The old hymn puts it this way. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on roses and the voice I hear Falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And so Jesus is alone with them, and he is teaching them. And I want you to notice the topic of his teaching in verse 31, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. The topic of his teaching was the crucifixion and the resurrection of himself. Jesus, again, is teaching these men that he is going to the cross And before they even get into a conversation about who the greatest is, Jesus demonstrates through his teaching that true greatness is found not in rebellion, but in joyful submission and obedience to the will of God. You see, all the disciples at this point in time wanted a political leader. They wanted a Messiah that would liberate them from Roman oppression. But Jesus came and he did not consent to their expectations, but rather he consistently and willingly submitted to the expectations of his father as he lived in obedience to his will. You see, Jesus is the greatest person who ever lived. And here he is preaching and teaching about the greatest sacrifice that would ever be made, the sacrifice of himself. Saints, don't miss this. The glory of God is accomplished through suffering. Whereas the glory of man always looks to avoid suffering. The word delivered in verse 31 is a double entendre, which means it has two different meanings. We know that according to the, the, the gospel accounts, that Jesus was delivered because Judas himself went and betrayed him for 30 pieces of silver. Judas betrayed Jesus. But the word delivered there isn't just a word that man gave up Jesus to be killed. It also indicates to us that God the Father was the one who willingly gave his son to the Roman soldiers in order for him to be hung on a cross. Because it was God who ultimately delivered Jesus over to men to be killed. And in these verses, we get to the very heart of the gospel. Listen to me. God purposefully killed his son in order that he might not kill you and me. There were a lot of people hung on a Roman cross. But Jesus was the only one who was hung on a Roman cross who lived to tell about it. And what I mean by that is he didn't avoid death. No, he endured death. And he rose victorious three days later over death. You see, in the kingdom of God, the way to the crown is by way of the cross. The salvation is ours, and it's ours by his suffering. In Acts 2.23, when Peter is preaching this sermon at Pentecost, he said, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. And so this, this delivered. This delivered here is not just the men giving Jesus over to the Roman soldiers, but it's God giving him over to them as well. And look at verse 32. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. This was willful ignorance. The disciples at this point in time still did not quite fully grasp what it was Jesus was teaching them. You see, they had no room for a dying Messiah in their their theological framework. A crucified Christ was not an embraced worldview for the Jews. They did not want a crucified king. They wanted a king that would rule and reign 
on earth. And what Jesus is telling the disciples here is that the glorious son of man that's mentioned in Daniel 7 is also the suffering servant who is mentioned in Isaiah 53. And yet they still did not understand that at this point in time. And so as we begin this incredible passage, this discourse on greatness, we begin by seeing that Jesus first tells us that the cross-shaped life, this, this greatness that we aspire to, can only be accomplished by living in obedience to the will of God. The second fact about a cross-shaped life I want you to see in the text is that a cross-shaped life is poured out in service to others. Notice what the text tells us in verses 33 and 34. It says, and they came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argue with one another about who was the greatest. Now, we can all look at this scene, especially those of you who have multiple children, okay? I endure conversations every single day about who shoots a basketball better, who hits a baseball harder, and who can throw a baseball the fastest. It is a daily discussion in my house about who the greatest is, and all of my children, shockingly, believe they are the greatest. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Or they think they are the greatest. The word disgusting here in the text means that Jesus didn't just ask them. He didn't just ask them what they were discussing on the way. He continued to press in and he asked them over and over and over again. What is it that you were talking about when we were walking through Galilee? You see, Jesus noticed an issue of sin even though they were behind him discussing quietly among themselves. And what he does here is he lovingly press ends, or he presses into that issue of sin in order to redefine what true greatness looks like. The disciples did not think that Jesus heard them along the way, but what we see here is that Jesus knows everything. Church, I want you to hear this. Whatever thoughts go through your mind, whatever whispers come out of your mouth, Jesus knows them intimately. And this is the scandalous part about the gospel. He loves you in spite of that. And then in verses 35 through 37, Jesus turns greatness on its head, showing us a radical shift in what it means to be great. He is rewriting what greatness truly looks like. Look at verse 35 and 36 and 37 with me. And he sat down and he called the 12 and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a child and put him in the midst of them. And taking him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. This was a radical shift in the definition of greatness. And this is what we see in the text, is that we must constantly fight the desire for position, recognition, and prestige. And I just wanna say this, I think a lot of people in church life over my time in small churches, small country churches, and by the way, there are some great small country churches. This is not a, a, a generalization, but I've seen men who did not have much of a title in their careers, and so when they came into church, they tried to take control and take power. And what we see here is that we have to fight against the desire for position, recognition, and power. It is a prideful heart that seeks a position. Jesus here in grace and in tenderness gives them a statement that shocked them. If anyone would be first, he must last of all, or he must be last of all, a servant of everyone. During my sophomore year at Northwest, we had an opportunity to go to Roklaw, Poland on a mission trip. There were two leaders of the trip. We had our BSU director and we had another man and we had months of planning to get to Poland. We arrived at the airport after flying on what seemed like a crop duster from Munich to Roklaw. We arrived at the airport, we got off the plane. There were some cars there waiting for us. There were prearranged before we got there and people started piling in the vehicles. There were about 18 or so of us on the team and Brother Tom, who was our BSU director, he was standing in the back. 
I was not standing in the back because I was selfless. I was standing in the back because I was with Brother Tom and I was trying to get something to eat before I got in the car. And so I highlight him in the story and not myself. And we get to the loading in the cars and, and, and all of a sudden cars are driving off and before I knew it, it was Brother Tom, me, and another student from the BSU standing there with no cars left. And I, I don't know what language you speak, but I do not speak German. I do, not, I do not speak a different language. And so we're sitting there and Brother Tom is, is saying, hey, they're gonna recognize we're out there in just a second. They're gonna turn around and come back and get us. Four hours later, <laughs> cars pull up. The other leader of the trip jumps out and says, I thought y'all were in the car. I didn't know y'all weren't in the car. And what dawned on me then and still has stuck with me to this day is that leaders do not always lead from the front. Sometimes leaders lead from the back, making sure that everyone else has what they need before they get what they need. Greatness is not about being in the front of the line, but being willing to step to the back for the good of others. Today is Mother's Day, which for most ladies in the room, you got married and you started to realize, hey, I've got to be more selfless. And then you had a child and you thought, I'm gonna willingly give up all the things that I want in order to make sure they have everything they need. This is the kind of greatness that Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about greatness that says, hey, we don't seek position and notoriety, we seek service. And when you serve others around you, when you serve them, then you're great in the kingdom of God. And to illustrate his point, Jesus takes a child and he places him in their midst. And now I wanna say this, in, in this context, a child did not have the same kind of social status that children do today. This would have been extremely unusual. There was a high infant mortality rate. People did not exalt children like we do in our time today. And I don't wanna get into the fact that so many people build their entire lives around their children and they, and they give them everything they want. But in this day, children ate last. Okay, my grandmother, who's 86 or seven, she tells me all the time, adults need to eat first. Children can eat when the adults are done. And I'm gonna be honest with you, now that I'm older and I'm an adult, I am with her, 100%. <laughs> Leave them jokers outside, let's take the first fruits, let's give them the leftovers, they're fine. <laughs> and so what Jesus was essentially saying here is that these were the least of these. These were people that no one was serving. And he says, whoever embraces them, whoever receives the least of these, whoever receives a child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not just me, but him who sent me. Jesus is saying, if you want to be great, pour your life out in service to those who can give you nothing in return. I'm not talking about the self-serving service that takes place in your workplace where you scratch someone's back so that in turn, five or six years later, when it comes around, they can scratch your back. Where you help someone with a motive of them one day helping you. That is not what Jesus is teaching here. Jesus is saying, pour your life out and serve those who will benefit you none. He's talking about the mentally impaired, the physically disabled, the aged. He says, you serve them and you'll have an audience with my father. The vivid imagery that Jesus uses teaches us that to be great, we must serve the least of these. And what we begin to see here is that service to others, radical service to others frees us from looking out for our own self-interest because service to others gets our eyes off of ourself and it places it on the people who are around us. Most people look to achieve greatness by ascending into a position of prominence. And what Jesus wants us to know is that you do not ascend into greatness, you descend into greatness. You become low in order to be great. Jesus himself demonstrates this 
In John chapter 13, when the disciples had gone off on a long journey, they came back in. They're getting ready to partake of the Lord's Supper. They're in the upper room. They have been walking all day long and they get to the upper room and they're looking around and there is no servant around to wash their feet. Now, I've told you all this before. I'm not a foot person. My children's feet touch me. I go wash immediately. Like I'm, I'm, I'm washing my hands, washing my arms. Not a foot person, just not what I am. In fact, I'm an anti-foot person, Okay. I don't wear anything but closed toe shoes anymore. Unless I'm at the beach, I'm gonna have tennis shoes on because I just, I'm not a foot person. Jesus gets to that upper room. And listen, we're not talking about feet that have been with socks and inside shoes. We're talking about disgusting feet that have been walking around in dirt and feces. And you can imagine the scene where Peter looks at John. He says, hey, He's gonna build his church upon my statement. And John's looking around, well, I'm the one who he loves. And then in a moment of just shocking servanthood, Jesus takes the towel and he takes water and he gets on his hands and his knees and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. And they're stunned. And then Jesus looks at them and he says, you likewise go and do to one another that a servant is not above his master. And if I, your teacher and Lord, will wash your feet, you ought to serve and wash the feet of the people who are around you. And it leads us to the third fact about a cross-shaped life that we see. A cross-shaped life number three is shaped, or is not shaped by jealousy. Look again at verse 38. It said, John said to them, teacher, We saw someone casting out demons in your name and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. Now, do not forget the immediate context of the passage because there is some real tension here because the disciples had just failed to cast out a demon in the previous passage, right? Jesus is on the mountainside or mountaintop being transfigured. They come down to discover that the disciples failed to cast out a demon out of a boy. And then they come across the man here in verse 38 who was doing what they in their own strength could not do. The jealousy and the frustrations were evident, especially in light of the fact that they took the issue to Jesus. The disciples in this moment were jealous, listen to me, not for truth and not for the glory of Christ, but they were jealous for the glory of themselves. This is a visible illustration of an already taught lesson on greatness. As Jesus is using these stories one after another to build his argument about what true greatness looks like. And here he says, true greatness. True greatness is not shaped by jealousy. You see, this was not a battle over truth. This was a battle over turf. As other followers of Christ were doing the works of Christ in their area. This is directly applicable to you and I. And I want you to hear me say this as loud as I possibly can. We are not in competition with other Bible-believing churches in Tate and DeSoto County. We're not in competition with them. We are, the Bible will say, co-laborers with them in expanding the kingdom of God. You see, allegiance to Christ will lead us And it should lead us to applaud and celebrate those on God's team, even if we are at different churches. Because God's kingdom is bigger than any one church. Because the kingdom of God is bigger than any one area. Now maybe they thought this man was casting out demons and he was like the, like the sons of Sceva. If you remember in the book of Acts, when we preached the book of Acts, the sons of Sceva find a demon-possessed man. They've been casting out demons and they go in and they say, the Jesus who Paul preached, I, I, I declare to you in, in, in the name of that Jesus to come out of the man. And the demon looks at the sons of Sceva. There's seven of them, by the way. And he says, Jesus I know and Paul I've heard of, but who are you? And the demon whooped all seven of them and they ran out of the house naked. Now I'm not a boxing expert. I'm not an MMA fighter watcher. I don't, I mean, if that's your thing, that's totally fine. But I know this, you get into a fight and you come out naked, you lost. (laughs) Those men lost, but that's not what's taking place here. Look at verse 39 through 41. But Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name 
will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Jesus responds to them by telling them not to hinder him, but to help him. Don't try to restrain him, but rejoice in the work that he is doing. And then he uses the illustration, hey, if you give somebody a cup of water in my name, they're partnering with you in this endeavor. And then he makes the statement, for whoever is not against us is for us. Whoever is not against us is for us. There was a clear, clear break here between people that were for Jesus and people who were against Jesus. And at the heart of what he's saying here is that at the end of the day, you're all just a bunch of nobodies trying to tell everybody about somebody. Jesus is the somebody that we're telling them about. John the Baptist had this same kind of encounter. We know the verse, he must increase, I must decrease. But the context surrounding that was that Jesus' disciples began to baptize more people than John and John's disciples were baptizing. And so John, John's disciples come to him and they say, hey, they're, they're all going to him. They're, they're not coming to us any longer. We've, you've got a great preaching ministry You're the most successful prophet that's ever been. They're going to him now. Why are they not coming to you? And John the Baptist responds that he must increase and I must decrease. And he recognized that the attention wasn't meant for himself. It was always meant to point them to Christ. And it leads us to the fourth fact about a cross-shaped life that we see in the text. I want you to see number four, that a cross-shaped life is committed to crucifying sin. Now, we didn't read this passage in the opening, but I want to read it, verse 42 now. It says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. The little ones mentioned here is not mentioning children necessarily, but those who were immature disciples, those who were young in their, in their belief in Christ. And so if verse 41 speaks of doing good to others, verse 42 addresses just the opposite. He says, if you cause just one disciple to stumble, it would be better for you to have a weight tied to you and for you to be thrown into the ocean. That's pretty vivid imagery. Jesus says, don't walk around puffed up and arrogant and prideful because you're supposed to be close with me. You're supposed to be spiritually mature. You're supposed to crucify sin. You see, the disciples were wrong about their thoughts on greatness and Jesus is warning them not to lead the weak astray. And in warning them, he is also warning us not to cause immature believers to stumble. Now notice verse 43 through 47. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame Then with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. What we learn here is that a saving faith is a faith that actively fights against and crucifies sin. Saints, we must engage in a spiritual battle with sin. And what Jesus gives us here is that sin is not conquered by giving in, but by cutting out. You see, if we're going to pursue holiness, we must be willing to cut things out. And that looks differently for everyone in this room. There are some people in this room, I have talked with men on a regular basis, and when they come to me and they admit to a pornography addiction, Listen, I go to the extreme immediately. I tell them, hey, if you have to get a flip phone, we're gonna get you a flip phone. And there's gonna be men in your life that walk with you to make sure that you don't get away from that flip phone. There, and it looks, some people may look at that and be like, well, that's, that's foolish, you don't need a flip phone. 
You need to cut things out of your life that cause you to stumble. Practical steps to pursuing holiness. And if that's putting software on your computer so that everybody sees every website that you, or I say everybody, so that a few people see every website you go to, then that's what you need to do. If it is, Jesus is not telling them here to to literally cut off their hand, to literally cut off their feet, to literally gouge their eyes out. What he's doing here is showing us that the mortification of sin, the crucifying of sin should be taken seriously. And that we are to go to great lengths in order to pursue Christ and pursue holiness. You see, evil actions come from a heart that rejoices in sin rather than in Christ. But sin is ultimately a worship issue. And so we must evaluate our lives to see if there are areas that do not fall under the authority of the Scriptures. One commentary writer wrote this, Very little, if any sin, comes out of your heart that didn't first enter through your eyes. He then goes on to add that our external members are but the instruments we employ to gratify the lust that emerges from within. Church, we must go to great lengths to kill sin. The Puritan preacher John Owen once said that we must be killing sin or sin will be killing us. I have no doubt there are believers in this room who are born again, who have trusted in Christ, and you wake up every day living in shame because of the battle that you have with sin because it's conquered you over and over and over again. I would encourage you today to go to whatever lengths necessary to remove it. If that's a flip phone, if that's accountability, whatever that is, the cross-shaped life is a life that is shaped and is committed to crucifying sin. Jesus is not advocating here for literal literal physical self mutilation, but a ruthless moral self-denial. You see, it's not a, mutil- a, a mutilation that Jesus is talking about, but mortification. And I think that's what we need to see here. And then in verses 48 through 50, he talks about being thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, How will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And so Jesus gives us vivid imagery of what hell looks like. He says that all of those, all of those who are ruled by sin, they'll be thrown into hell. Saints, we think of hell often. Maybe the most terrifying passage in all the Bible is where Jesus looks at some followers and they say, we cast out demons in your name. We did many works. We, we, we prayed, we prophesied, we did all these things. And Jesus looks at them and he says, depart from me for I never knew you. I said this morning, I believe it's important for everyone in the room to answer the question. Do I do religious things or am I known by God? Religion has never saved anyone. Jesus and Jesus alone saves. And if you've never repented of sin and you've never trusted in Christ, I want you to know this. You will spend eternity in a Christless hell where his wrath is poured out on sin forever. We're going to have an invitation in a moment. And the invitation is for you to come and to repent of sin. I want you to know that Jesus lived a life that you were meant to live but couldn't live. He lived a sinless, perfect life. He then died a sinner's death, a death that you and I deserve because of sin. He died a sinner's death so that you and I, through him, could be forgiven you've never trusted in Jesus, you've never repented of sin, I would encourage you this morning to come and to give your life to Christ and to repent of sin. I have four points of application and we'll 
conclude our time together. Number one, I want to encourage you to seek to overcome the desire for position and recognition. Seek to overcome the desire for position and recognition. Listen, I am a words of affirmation man. I cut my grass on Friday. Austin knows that I like this, so she told me two or three times, the grass really looks good. And it didn't get old, but even, and as many times she told me it didn't get old. But sometimes affirmation can be sin. Seeking affirmation can be sin. And so look to overcome the desire for position and recognition. Number two, pour your life out in humble service to those around you. I want you to know you'll never regret serving the people around you. You will never regret putting their needs above yours. And so pour your life out in humble service to them. Number three, guard against jealousy when others are seeing success. This isn't just in ministry life. You should want your friends to do well. You should want your friends to get promotions. You should want your friends' children to walk in obedience and do well. Austin and I were at a six-year-old uh, coach pitch baseball game watching Dawson the other day, and it was a real tight game. And I looked at Austin, and I said, is it wrong that I want this other kid here to strike out? Like, we gotta get this game. Number one, I was tired, it was late. And number two, I wanted to win. And she was like, yes, that's wrong, don't say that. People can hear you. But we need to guard against jealousy when others are seeing success. And number four, identify sin and work hard at putting it to death. If there is sin hidden in your heart this morning, and if what you have said, looked at, or thought about over the last week or month were laid bare to everyone here, what would it cause you to do this morning? Church, I want you to know that Jesus sees all of it. He sees all of it and he desires for you to crucify it. Coming to Jesus isn't finding your best self. Coming to Jesus is about crucifying self. And if there's sin in your heart and in your life, I would encourage you this morning to repent of sin and to crucify it and turn back to Christ and begin today walking with Jesus. And if you're an unbeliever and the God of self has been on the throne of your life for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, I would encourage you and plead with you today before it is everlasting too late to repent of sin, trust in Jesus, and to place Jesus on the throne of your hearts. And so we're gonna have an invitation. I'll be at the front. There are men and women all over this room that would love to take you to my office, to Matt's office, to show you with an open Bible what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus. And so I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna give you that opportunity. Father, I love you and I thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would convict hearts this morning. God, I pray that you would draw men and women to yourself. God, I pray that you would expose sin in the hearts of those that are wandering from you. God, I pray that today would be a day where they repent and turn back to Christ. God, whatever it is you're doing in hearts across this room, God, I pray that our surrender would be on the table. God, that our yes would be there. So God, move during this time. We love and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, stand with me.